So it's tough to talk after so many talks about being overcrowded. I'm overcrowded myself about the many ways we can be overcrowded. So when I was started thinking about this, what shall I talk about? I asked myself, yes, let's go back to basics. And let's talk about people, right? Overcrowded meaning how many can we be? So this is the talk I'm going to give you today. How many can we be? You might think such a stupid questions or simple. Indeed, it depends on context, right? If we see how many can we be in this room right now, that's an easy one. I've been told TED allows 100 people room, and this room has a 100 people occupancy. And it's nice to see that it's, except for some chairs in the front, maybe that, my, that is my own, actually. And it's actually pretty full. But the question, of course, is a much bigger one. I'm giving a TED. I have to have big topics in my end. And so I'm thinking about how many can we be on this planet. Now, this is a much more complex and a much more difficult question to answer. And I would not answer it. I can tell you already. I will only provide arguments. To do so, you have to come with me on a journey, on a journey through time and space. And the journey begins, our journey begins, at the dawn of the agricultural revolution. That's 10,000 years ago. Two million people lived on the planet at that time, but thanks to the agricultural revolution, that number steadily increased, slowly but steadily. Ten times more people at the times of the Egypt and the pharaohs. We were 20 million over the whole world. And then it took a few thousand more years to get to 200 million people. That's the Roman Empire. And after that, things have changed a lot. You can see it here. Now it has gone. 7,000. 500 million people, that's 7.5 billion people, right? And counting, counting by about 2.4 people every second. That means in a minute, we'll, this room will be full. So where are we going to go? And where are we going to end up? We don't know for sure. We know at least 9 billion people by mid-century, that's pretty sure. But after that, who knows? 9, 10, 13? And that makes, of course, a big difference. So we have taken over the world, literally taken over the world, and I would say, in many ways, we have succeeded. Like, think about poverty. People who are chronically poor, those people who cannot make a living, those people who are below the poverty line of $1 a day. Number of people who are very poor, 700 million people today. That's a large number. That's big. And we should think about them, and we should have policies promoting the eradication of poverty. But that's, in a way, only 10% of the population. Now, only 100 years ago, it was a completely the opposite. 90% of the population were chronically poor, in absolute poverty, and 10% was not. So we have been succeeded tremendously, if you're according to these views. And why? What are the factors that allowed us to prosper? Population itself is one. Education, knowledge, and above all, technology. And technology, if I have to think about one technology that sums best the technological evolution of the last 150 years, and I'm certainly not new to this, but I think about energy. Now, we need energy for everything we do. We need energy to run our economies, we need energy to prosper. Without energy, 3 billion people would be dead in a week. And energy has always been very expensive in the history of humanity. It was a luxury. Not anymore. Let there be light, then, not in the biblical sense, but thanks to the ingenuity and to the technological development that we humans have brought to the planet. Now, we used, always used to live in a planet when the sun set, uh, sun set down. Yeah, there were fires, but essentially there was darkness. This is no longer the case. The map of the Earth by night shows you that where there is people and where there's money, there is light. Of course, there's also places in the world, which we should not forget, where people don't have access to energy. So overall, I think this is a great story. And I guess... You agree with me. But is it really so? And in a way, maybe not. You know, in order 
to create this empire, we have polluted it too. We need energy for everything we do, but energy comes with a price tag. This is a beautiful, I should say beautiful and yet terrifying images taken from NASA satellites tracking CO2 emissions around the world. You can see how emissions move. They move through the currents of the atmosphere. One ton done in this room right now, as I'm speaking and I'm using energy, right, is exactly the same as one ton done in New Zealand. There's no difference. Most importantly, one ton of CO2 stays in the atmosphere forever. You can think of it essentially as plastic in the air, only you don't see it, but it's such. The residence time is essentially infinite. You can also see where it does it come from, from places where there are people and money and economic activities and energy, which now, because fossil fuels are so cheap and such a great source of energy, we are using to satisfy our energy demand. Of course, they change over time. They change on the places. You see differences between north and south hemispheres because nature is giving us a big help. Now, oceans and land is absorbing about half of the CO2 that we emit. You see it near now coming. You see, June is coming. The plants are growing and they are sucking up CO2 also in the northern hemisphere. So you see CO2 going down. That's beautiful, but still, the other half of CO2 remains there, and we're adding it up. What are the consequences? Well, the consequences are pretty well known. Temperature grow as a result of accumulation of CO2. That's science which is unequivocal. They've been growing since ever recorded, you see here. And they've been growing faster in the most recent decades. What was the hottest year ever recorded since human history? 2016. Before that, 2015. Before that, 2014. I guess you get it, right? Temperatures are now above 1 degree Celsius above pre-industrial. That's the average over land and sea. We don't inhabit, inhabit the seas. We live on land where temperatures have increased more. And we are on our way for an increase in temperature by 4 or 5 degrees at the end of the century which is way above what the scientists tell us about, and the policymakers too, to some extent, that is, that we should keep temperature below certain thresholds, such as two degrees. What will be the consequences of climate change? Well, there are going to be risks, and they will affect many things, agriculture, health, energy, ecosystems. These risks are currently poorly understood. We are trying to understand them more and more. We use scenarios and future words here in colors to depict words of technological change, on climate factors, on economic progress. And depending on the thousands of scenarios that we generate with the international community of scientists and economists and many different communities working on the same problem, and data analysts too, we come up with pictures like this, right? What do they tell you? Two things are pretty clear. First one, climate change is an amplifier of risks. What you see here, you see fat tails, long tails. Climate change is essentially making the planet more dangerous to live. So to solve climate change, we have to do risk management. And that's pretty much an unequivocal result. It changes, it depends on the scenarios, but it is a question of risk. The second one is about who is going to be affected by climate change the most. Bad news here, turns out that the impacts will not be the same. We already have a problem of global inequality. It's one of the major challenges we are facing right now. Now, climate change will make it for us almost, almost for sure worse. Why? Because the impacts of climate change will be differentiated across different parts of the world. Now, it turns out that According to the latest estimates, the places that will be affected the most, which are now in red, red means bad, okay, and hot also, are those places which are in between the tropics. Not a surprise, you might say, those places happen to be also the hottest already right now. On top of that, the economies and the countries which are living there, 
depend on agriculture to a, large extent, to a large extent, so they are more exposed to climatic shocks. So the story here is that climate change will make global inequality even worse, will exacerbate inequality. Those are countries which are already poor today, where those 700 million people that I was telling you about before are concentrated. And they will be hit and will feel the impact of climate more. Coming back to our talk, that's also the population boom. Now, where is the population, the new people? Where will they be living? Exactly in the same places. You see the color code here? Use the same color code as the previous chart. You know, think about Africa. Africa alone is expected to have an additional 1.6 billion people over the next few decades. I'm saying 1.6 additional billion people to the almost uh, 800 million people they already now. South Asia, Southeast Asia, 600 million people. Now, it's hard to imagine uh, such a population growth concentrated in exactly those very same places that we just saw will be the ones that will feel climate change the most. We already see now the consequences of impacts and conflicts in nearby countries, not caused by climate change, contrary to what some, some, someone says. We already feel it through the migrants who tend to reach, try to reach our shores for those who make it, those who do not make, do not make it. And we see the political ramification of migrations, which is happening in Europe. We see it every day. Now, can you imagine the consequences of impacts uh, due to growing temperatures on such huge population addition, of course, it's thrilling for them and for us. So what shall we do? And here I have, finally, you might say, yes, a bit of uplift, some good news. There are ways we, many ways we can deal with the problem. Uh, first one, of course, move from fossil fuels to non-fossil fuels. Low carbon energy, such as renewables, not only renewables, including renewables, has been increasing at rapid pace in the past few years. The cost of renewable energy has gone down by a factor which was even unimaginable only a few years ago. Everyone got it wrong. All the projections were wrong. So that's good. It's making progress. Still not as good as fossil fuels. It's hard to beat fossil fuels, but making progress. Houses. Energy efficiency is so important. We just don't need to reduce energy emissions, but we also need to reduce our consumption of energy. And we have houses, smart homes, technology, big data, a lot of things can now make us much more efficient than before. Now, these are the two classical ones you hear in the newspapers all the time. They are great. They won't work by themselves unless there are policies to regulate CO2 emissions, which for now we are not seeing sufficiently, such as carbon taxes. To others more that you don't often hear about, money. Let's grow less. Economic growth is a major factor in the emission. Of course, this is a difficult one. Uh, we know it very well in these countries, sluggish economic performance. And we didn't do de it de actually very well on emissions. Now, the other one no one is talking about is demographics. And why is no one talking about? It used to be discussed a lot. In the 1970s, all environmental movements were talking about population control. No longer the case, it's a tough choice. It is a tough choice. Myself, I have three kids, yeah? Despite the fact that I am known for sure that having a, an extra son was probably the most important environmental decision of my life. And yet, here we are. So how many can we be then? Well, I have no answer, as I told you, up front. I only have possible and different worlds. A world where we're gonna be nine billion people and decreasing with high education. Primary education, secondary education, upper secondary education for a lot of people. You see it in the shades of red. That's a world where education plays such a big role, of course, for population. It also plays such a big role on productivity and also at the values we give to planet and environment. At the same time, we might end with a world with 13 billion people Low-level education, no access to basic schooling, to primary education for many living on the world. Very limited access to tertiary or secondary education. Now, I think these two worlds are pretty much have equal chances of happening. It might actually be 
that the 13 million people is more likely. And it's up to us to decide in which world we will live. Actually, not us in this room, but us here, on this planet, and the generation that will come after us. In a way, we would like this planet to be bigger, so that more people can live. We would like this planet to have a thicker atmosphere, so that more CO2 can be added without consequences. But, unfortunately, this is not the case. We have one Earth, and it is a beautiful one. Especially if you compare it to alternatives. You're wondering, that's Mars. It's also small, right? Let's keep it healthy. Thanks for listening.